Well, well, I have to say, I am so pleased to be here. I have waited 10 years, 10 years to tell this story. Uh, I remember after 9-11 when my CIA handler, Richard Fuse, told me that uh, there really wasn't going to be much of a 9-11 investigation. And we were going to try to keep the people calm. That's what he said. We're going to keep them calm. Uh, and I said, what do you mean? <laughs> uh, he said, well, we don't really need them to know everything that we were doing before 9-11. And I said, well, why? <laughs> what do you think what do, what do you think's going to happen when they find out that you didn't tell them the truth? Why don't you just tell them the truth right now? And he said, well, that's not really what they want to do. So I had, uh, and, and uh, I had different ideas. Uh, I will tell you straight off the bat that right after 9-11, my CIA handler received a $13 million payoff from the 9-11 investigation that was supposed to be money used for the Iraqi, uh, to secure Iraq's cooperation. And I ended up getting indicted on the Patriot Act. I was the second non-Arab American ever indicted on the Patriot Act after Jose Padilla. And my crime was in opposing terrorism and, and going to Congress, and I had spoken to the staff of Senator John McCain and Senator Trent Lott, and I had pounded them. I called their chiefs of staff, their legislative directors, and their foreign policy people, and I said, I wanna, I'm, I'm an asset who covered Iraq and Libya at the United Nations, and I have a story to tell, and you need to hear what I have to say. And within 30 days, I am not making this up. This is actually, doc thanks to the Patriot Act, uh, <laughs> Uh, all of my phone calls to these offices are taped by the FBI, so I can actually prove that they occurred. And I have the dates, I have the, phone, I have the actual phone conversations on tape. Uh, and within 30 days of those conversations, I woke up to hear the FBI pounding at my door, and I got up out of bed and I looked out the window and there are men in flak jackets in my porch. And I open the door, and I, they, they come into my house, and they're like, Ms. Susan, and the FBI agent is shaking. He's shaking. And he said, uh, you are Susan Lindau, or you are hereby notified you are under arrest on the Patriot Act. And I said, what? You, may, you have the right to remain silent, anything you say, et cetera, et cetera. He read me my Miranda rights, and I was just like, what are you talking about? I'm making coffee. <laughs> you know, I'm not a bank robber. I'm not a drug dealer. I'm not a murderer. I haven't broken any laws that I can think of. And, and I have no idea what you say that I've done. He said, well, your attorney will explain it to you later on. Okay? Okay. That began a, a five-year indictment, five-year nightmare on the Patriot Act. I was never taken to trial. I never, I was, in five years, I was allowed one morning of testimony with two witnesses. The two witnesses were a chief of staff, former chief of staff for a congressional member of Congress, and my old friend, Park Godfrey, who verified the 9-11 warnings that I'm going to talk about tonight. And I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to let you guys ask a lot of questions, and I know you're going to have a lot of questions. I'm going to do my best to answer as, as honestly as I can. I do not have all the answers, but I will tell you up front that I believe there was both the hijackings, and, and that does not mean that I'm right and you're wrong. I believe there were both hijackings and a controlled demolition scenario, and I'll explain to you how the whole thing fits together. And you may disagree, and that's okay if you disagree with me. But I can tell you, but, but, I'll, but, but, when you, but when you hear what I have to say, you'll understand why I've reached this conclusion. So, so I believe both of them happened, okay? Um, and, I, and it's also very important for you to know that as the 10-year anniversary of 9-11 comes up, you, I mean, no, no offense, but you guys have no idea what actually happened. This is like so much, the lies are so much bigger than what you know. And it's so much deeper, and it's so much more tragic once you have the truth. So on that note, uh, let me just take you to, uh, I'm actually going to start, I'm going to move you a little bit ahead to remember when George Bush and, and uh, uh, was, they were counting the votes in Florida. 
okay? I'm going to take you back to November of 2000. Uh, they had not yet declared that uh, George Bush had won the election. We, I was having uh, meetings with the no full knowledge and permission of the CIA with, the Iraq, with Iraq's ambassador to the United Nations on resuming the weapons inspections. It is very important for you to understand that country, this, this story with 9-11 also ties in deeply to what happened with Iraq. And contrary to everything you were told, the Iraqis were not resistant to weapons inspections. They had a comprehensive agenda. The CIA had already a comprehensive agenda for resolving the entire conflict without war at all. And it involved weapons inspections, cooperation with anti-terrorism, and uh, major financial contracts for U.S. corporations, and oil. Uh, and this would be developed over a period of time. But we already had, by November of 2000, we already had an agreement with the Iraqi government. We had a framework agreement that was, at that point, it was undefined, uh, not so well defined, and, and we had to make it defined. But they had already consented to all of these things. They wanted peace with us. And um, so by February of 2001, the Iraqis had agreed to offer, uh, to invite the FBI to send a task force into Baghdad with authorization to conduct terrorism investigations and to make arrests of terror suspects. This is very important for you to understand. So this is like the, the background of what you have to know. Okay, in April of 2001, I was summoned to my, oh, this is already happening. The comprehensive peace framework, those discussions are already underway. And I am, at this point, the chief asset covering the Iraqi embassy and the Libya house, both of them, I do both of them, and Yemen and Syria and Egypt and Malaysia. But, yeah, but Iraq and Libya are my primary countries. And uh, so I'm a back channel, which means that the government, the U.S. government gives me messages to give the Iraqis, and then the Iraqis give me messages to give to Washington. So I know everything. Every single conversation is going through me. And I can tell you that in April of 2001, I was summoned to my CIA handler, Dr. Richard Fuse, and he said he had a message for me to deliver to New York at the earliest possible convenience. And the message was this. We are looking for information on a conspiracy to hijack airplanes. We expect the target to be the World Trade Center. We think they're going to fly the airplanes into the World Trade Center. And uh, we want the Iraqis to provide any, it's called actionable intelligence. Actionable intelligence is a name, an airport hub, a flight number, something that's going to help us identify who they are, where they're meeting, who, what their nationalities are, anything like this. And he says, he gives me a message, and he says, we want this information, and I want you to tell the Iraqis that if they fail to give us this information, and if it is later determined that they knew the information and they did not give it to us, then the United States is prepared to go to war with Iraq. Okay, this is April of 2001. Well, I went up to, to New York and I was very, we were in the middle of these great negotiations. We already had an invitation, from February of 2001, we had an invitation for the FBI to come to Baghdad. So I go up to New York, I'm very pleasant. I'm very polite. There's no reason to be nasty with these people. They want peace. I say, hey, could you please send a message to Baghdad? We'd like this information. If you come across anything, you know, you've all, Saddam had been one of our best sources on terrorism throughout the 1990s. Iraq hated terrorists because they believed that um, they hated Islamic jihadis. He hate, I mean, he did. Whether you like Saddam or not, whether you hate Saddam or not, he hated Islamic conservatives. He was convinced that they would take advantage of the, uh, the crumbling of authority in Baghdad under the sanctions and that they would then uh, try to overthrow, overturn his government and the poverty of the people from the, the sanctions would, would fuel this, this problem, would, would help overturn his government. So he wanted to help us at every turn 
keep these people, fr you know, from, from becoming too powerful. Okay. And so we knew this. So when I go to New York in April of 2001, I'm very friendly. And I say, hey, look, you, could you send the message to Baghdad? Let them know we're looking for this. Thanks. And the message from the Iraqis in April of 2001 is, hey, send the FBI. We've already agreed to send the you can. We've already invited you to send the FBI. Come on. Tell them, just bring them on. Sure. Wow. You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> okay. So I go back, to, Rich, I go back to, to Washington, and I get a phone call from Richard. He said, come down. Come down to my office. I want to hear what they said. I go down. I said, oh, I was real polite. I, yeah, yeah. You know, I gave him the message. Sure, sure. He said, I didn't tell you to be nice. I told you to tell those. You're, this is going to be on television, right? This is going to be like. Okay, well, we'll be, well, I'll, I'll soft pedal what he said. He was like, you, t you go back to, you stupid, goddamn blankety, 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 blankety. I told you to tell those SOB, MFers, God, GD, blah, 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 screaming, circling me around his conference. I can, I'll never forget it, circling his conference desk, ranting and raving, waving his arms around. He didn't do that very often. He's, he does not have that kind of personality. He's a very calm man, and he feels that if you're, if you're really angry at somebody, then the more calm you are, the more dangerous you are. That's CIA. He's old school CIA. Okay, so he's screaming now. And I go back, he's like, you go back to New York and you deliver the message exactly the way that I told you to deliver the message. And I said, well, Richard, I don't want them to think I'm threatening them because, you know, I'm a, I believe in, like, negotiations and conflict resolution. He said, no, no, I don't want them to think you are threatening them. And he said, I don't want them to think I am threatening them. I want you to tell them this threat of war originates at the highest level of government above the CIA director and above the Secretary of State, that it would be three men, President George Bush, Vice President Dick Cheney, and Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, and no one else. Those are the three people who are threatening war. And I want to be really clear about the message that I was ordered to give them. We demand that you turn over any actionable, any fragment of intelligence outlining a, 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 a conspiracy involving airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center. If you withhold this information, if we discover that you have withheld this information and the attack occurs, then we will bomb you back to the Stone Age. You will be bombed harder than you've ever been bombed before. You will be destroyed. You cannot, you've never been hit the way we're going to hit you now. Okay, so... Okay, so I went up and I delivered that message. This is May of 2001. In June and July, practically every single week, my CIA handler, Dr. Richard Fuse, and I talked about 9-11. And it was very clear that the intelligence community was being prepped for two things. One, to expect airplane hijackings. Now, I have to be honest with you, because I know a lot of you are interested in the controlled demolition. They prepped us to expect the airplane hijackings. They told us about it. They tried, they demand, like my CI handler demanded that Iraq had to give us this. And they, they d insisted that if, they, if it happened, there would, be a, there would be dire consequences. Now, what you're going to see in my book, and I, we have more copies of my book outside. We can, we've got more, or more here, too. Um, the, 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 there was something else going on that summer that was really beautiful. This peace framework that we had been working on was, was magnificent. It was turning out just glorious for a peace dividend. The Iraqis were now offering the weapons inspections, which of course we, that we, the United States had very rigorous standards for the weapons inspections. Iraq was offering cooperation with anti-terrorism to allow the FBI to go in. And Iraq started to offer a lot more. A lot more came on the table. By the summer, by June and July of 2001, Iraq was offering the United States preferential contracts. Now, think about the economy today. Preferential contracts for the United States corporations on telecommunications, healthcare, hospital equipment, pharmaceuticals, transportation. Iraq offered to buy one million American manufactured automobiles every year for 10 years. Think of what that would have done to the economy. Think about non-dual-use factory production. And all of this was, because the CIA was like, 
you know, if we're going to give up these darn sanctions, we're going we're gonna, <laughs> to take a pound of flesh with it. They had no, you know, and whether you like the CIA or not, and most of you, 99% of you don't like the CIA, I realize that, of course. But the CIA was doing what it's supposed to do, whether you like it or not. They were taking care of what is in the best interest of the United States government, with the best interest of the United States economy, and they were not going to let Iraq punish the United States and I hated the sanctions. I was doing this because I hated the sanctions. I was doing it because I thought because they had destroyed education. They wiped out literacy in a single generation. They destroyed the hospitals and the healthcare system. Iraq performed the second heart transplant in the world. And we wiped them out. Okay? Uh, 11,000 people died every month. By the end of 1996, 500,000 children had died of sanctions, and they only counted five-year-olds and younger. They didn't even count the six-year-olds, because the United Nations was holding back the numbers. And after that report in, at the, in December of 96, they stopped counting it. They, the United Nations never published another report on the deaths. So frequently what you will hear is that only 500,000 children died, but in fact, they continued to die, and approximately one million children died. They were babies. What did, they weren't even alive when the first Gulf War happened. This was an offense against, you know, this is genocide. This is a mass genocide. So that's my motivation. But the CIA did not have my motivation. They were out to make sure that the United States was not going to be punished for what they had done. And I was like, and, and believe me, by this point, we just wanted to get rid of the sanctions. The Iraqis were like, if that'll get rid of the sanctions, you bet. We'll give them anything they want. So before 9-11, you could have had every single thing you possibly could dream of. And if the CIA could have thought of more to ask for, we would have. We would have asked for, it was shameless. Okay, so, so you have peace that's breaking out in the Middle East. You have the 9-11 warnings. And then in August of 2001, uh, we went into high mode, high activity mode. On all, I can tell you the exact day, uh, on August 2nd, and after I tell you this, I'll open it up to questions. Um, on August 2nd was the uh, Senate nomination hearings for Robert Mueller who, to head the FBI. He was going to be the FBI director. And I was on the phone with my CIA handler, Richard Fuse, and I said, there's not one single terrorism investigation this man hasn't thrown. He... Oops. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> he, threw the nine, he threw the Oklahoma City bombing investigation. He threw Lockerbie. And I said, this man should not be the FBI director when this next attack occurs. And Richard Fuse said to me, my God, what if there is no FBI director when this happens? I said, do you think it's that soon? Do you think the attack is imminent? He said, oh, yeah. He said, it's absolutely just in the next couple of weeks. He said, this is, he said, I don't want, and I said, well, God, Richard, I'll go back to New York right now, and I'll get, I'll pump the Iraqis and see if they've got anything from Baghdad. I'll see if they have any news for us. And he said, oh, my God, Susan, don't go back to, do not go back to New York City. It's too dangerous. We are expecting a, the use of a miniature thermonuclear device. And they were not afraid that I was going to be hurt by like, falling debris in the World Trade Center. I wasn't going to be at the World Trade Center. They were afraid of radiation contamination, like the winds blowing the radio radioactive stuff. And that's what they, he was like, don't go up there. We're expecting mass casualties. And I said, well, Richard, you know, I'll go up the, you know, the day after. This was a, I can tell you the exact day. It was a Thursday. And I said, I will go up to New York on Saturday, and I'll report to you on Monday, and we'll just find out if the Iraqis have anything to give us. I went up to New York. The Iraqis said, ain't got nothing. We don't know. We don't know anything about this. You keep telling us about this. The only way we know about it is because you're talking about it. But we don't have any information to give you. And if we did, we understand the consequences. We know that if we don't help you, you're going to go to war with us if you think we did. And we, if there was anything we could give you, we would do it. So I go back and I report that on August 6th. On August 6th, there is a memo to the president telling him that th this is a high security threat, that it is an emergency level, that it's imminent. Okay. I, at my meeting with Richard Fuse, Richard Fuse tells, does something very important. He tells me that because of my direct contacts with Iraq and Libya, 
I should be the one. I am perfectly positioned, because everyone likes to think that Iraq and Libya are involved in terrorism to begin with. I should be the one to contact U.S. Attorney General John Ashcroft's office, and I should tell them that we're looking for an emerg what's called an emergency broadcast alert across all agencies seeking any fragment of intelligence involving airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center identified specifically. And I, call, I make that phone call. Uh, that, that con my conversation was refused is August 6th. Probably August 7th, August 8th, I call them. And immediately I talk to the, pri I have a private phone number. You see, huh, you guys couldn't get this number, but I have it, okay? I have the number inside the Attorney General's office. I'm not calling a switchboard. I'm calling his private staff, okay? I'm calling his, like, his, his government liaison office. His, his, you know, no, no, let me, no, that's not true. I call his private internal office. There are about 20 members of his private staff. His legislative director is there. His government relations person is there. But I call inside that office. And they give me the, office for the, the phone number for the Office of Counterterrorism. They say, repeat exactly what you just told us and tell them. I am told that John Ashcroft said, oh, those CIA people keep talking about terrorism. And they keep talking about this darn airplane hijacking. And they're so paranoid. And why do they keep bugging us about it? That's what I'm told they said. <laughs> uh, but I did what I did. And when I did that, I apparently tripped some wires because it denied the White House, it denied the Justice Department and the Attorney General's office of deniability, plausible deniability. And that's very important. And that is why they came after me so hard and tried to destroy me utterly because they could not admit to you that we had absolutely anticipated this thing. We knew it was going to happen exactly as it did go down, with one exception. And here's where I just, and then I'm, I'm going to finish this and then I'll open the floor to questions. Um, the, uh, what, what, it, what I have learned since then, now all the things that I've told you were things I did directly. So I'm telling you, I'm not relating what somebody else did or a conversation that somebody else had that has been reported to me. This is direct primary knowledge from my own experience. But what I'm going to tell you now is from somebody else, okay? And so I, I distinguish these two things. I have been told that some, by somebody who saw the videos that at the World Trade Center, on approximately, from approximately August 23rd, and it could have been August 22nd, it could have been August 24th. Okay, approximately August 23rd until approximately September 3rd. And again, it could be September 2nd. The spooks can be weird about this stuff. Okay, they could say, well, there, it wasn't September 4th. So no. No, it could have been September 3rd, okay? It could have been September 2nd. Right in, within a couple of days of this, my friend says that between the, at, at, at approximately 3 o'clock in the morning, strange vans, and there were just maybe three of them, he said, that not just a couple. The way he put it was a couple of vans. So we're thinking three, possibly four, but most likely three. A couple of vans arrived at 3 o'clock in the morning after the janitorial trucks had left the building. And it's very important because they were able to identify the vans according to make, model, color, and uh, there were no markings on the vans, but the janitorial vans did have markings. And so they were able to distinguish that these are not the same vans. And they know how the janitorial trucks left the building, and the, they actually tracked the paths that the janitorial trucks took to drive home. Like the janitorial workers were driving down certain roads to get over to, to their houses, and the CIA, or the FBI, the NSA folks tracked those people home. Um, and they're deter they're, he was quite convinced that these are not the same trucks. And between the hours of 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock, these trucks had never been in this building before. It was an anomaly. Definitely, it wasn't like it was going on for months and months and it just continued. They showed up for 10 days, 10 or 11 days approximately. Then they were never seen again. And that's when they believed they wired the building. And they do believe, and, and, and my friend told me absolutely it was a thermate bomb. 
a thermite bomb with a, it was a thermite bomb with a potential sulfur in it. The sulfur it makes it uh, is a uh, the, 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 the important thing about a thermite bomb is it is a it is a, an extraordinary heat reducing bomb. Okay, it it re, it's, it creates it takes steel and it creates molten steel. So it takes beams of steel and it turns it into molten steel and it just rot everything underneath just sinks into the ground like what you saw. And it is it is a, it is a, it is a special U.S. military grade weapon. Okay. It is a military-grade weapon. It's not something you could make ever in your kitchen or your, or your garage or your, or your living room. It is impossible for you to do this. This is a U.S. military weapon. And so I, uh, I do believe that that helps to explain uh, some, of the, the missing, some of the missing pieces. And I believe this is what happened. Uh, they had known in it, they'd known about the terrorist attack for months. There is a long-term advanced knowledge. Assets are being watched. The, 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 terror, the so-called terrorists, whether you want to think of them as re whether, whether they're real, Mohammed Atta was an asset trained by the United States government, supervised by the United States government. And I can assure you that assets, and I'm speaking directly from my own personal experience, assets are heavily controlled individuals. I was never dealing with Iraq and Libya without somebody paying extremely close attention to me at every stage, and my phones were tapped. I mean, at some point, they, they, had, they had wired my house. <laughs> when they had the handover of the two Libyan men, I went down to my basement the same day that they handed over the men, and my ceiling of my basement had been torn out, and there were cable wires dangling from the ceiling, about a dozen cable wires. And I had a contractor come over to my house and he said, wow, you really, somebody really put a kick-ass stereo system in your house. That's amazing. He said, you have, you have these wires going to every single room of your house, even in your bathroom. And I was like, ew. You know? But yeah, but he, he was like, they, he said, it's everywhere. He said, you must have like a stereo system that just, you know, rocks in this house. Um, but... So anyway, but the point is, is that assets, they, they, there's no way that these assets could have functioned without everyone knowing every single detail of what they were doing. There's no way they could have hidden. They could not have disguised their actions from their handlers. Even if they tried to disguise it, it wouldn't work. Believe me, it wouldn't work. <laughs> they, you know, they, they, you know, no, it's impossible. Impossible. And so it's more likely that they were using Mohammed Atta to guide the conspiracy, to track the conspiracy, and then they discovered that they were bozo pilots, they were clowns, they weren't any good at this flying stuff, and now they had an agenda. And the agenda was that when this attack happened, they were going to go to war with Iraq. But, oh gosh, we've got a problem now. Because the problem is they're not going to be able to do the job. Uh-oh. Oh, what a bummer. We're not going to be able, if, if, you see, you see, here's the thing about all, and I'm speaking now for, again from experience. The 1993 World Trade Center attack killed five people. The, the bombing of the USS Cole killed 12 people. And once the smoke and clears and the catastrophe, the chaos is over and the noise is done, it's pretty, you know, it's like, it's, it's all, there's not a lot of damage that would just, that would, certainly not enough that would allow a government, a pro-war cabal, to throw itself into a new war with Iraq, which they wanted to do. They've already decided to do it. And so, that is the motivation. There can, the thing is, there can never be a, any police officer will tell you, there is no crime without a motive and opportunity. And we had both. So it's not like they just spontaneously wired the World Trade Center. They knew it was coming, and they wanted to make sure that they had maximum damage when it hit. They knew they were going to use the airplanes as the cover to demolish the building. So it's not, you know, a lot of people in the 9-11 truth community have gotten kind of, at first, when I first broke this news, they were like, you know, a lot of people attacked me, and they said, you're saying there were airplane hijackings. No, no, there was a demolition. And I'm like saying, no, no, there's both of it. Both things happened. They, they, knew this, they knew the airplanes were going to be hijacked, so they used it as a cover 
for the, to, to guarantee maximum destruction because they already knew the consequence of war. So, uh, 